It takes a rather special type of men to drive sports cars in competition. There must be a special love for fine machinery, special knowledge of how to use it well, a special desire to compete and win. Such is the type of men who bring Jaguars and MGs and Elvas to the Grand Prix at Watkins Glen. The Elva is an English-made car that's named for the French phrase, Elva, she goes. This one lives up to her name in an early morning practice run. It checked out well, taking downshifts easily at the slow turns. Acceleration through the long backstretch was smooth. The lap time is good. The driver and his mechanic are both satisfied with its performance. The car is ready to race. But it took long hours of careful work to make it ready. Just as a highly bred racehorse requires special care and handling, a competition sports car must be critically tuned and specially adjusted for every race it enters. If a driver is to exhibit the skill of a fungio and the reflexes of a nuvolari on the track, he needs the mechanical savvy of a Kettering in the garage. Before the race ever begins, he must be certain his car is capable of responding instantly to his every command. Only when a driver has this assurance can he enter a race with the careful confidence that's needed to win. Drivers call registration formalities the lineup. Often, over 200 drivers enter the various events in the Watkins Glen Grand Prix. As each driver registers, his Sports Car Club of America license is checked. His car is entered in its proper class and its race number is recorded. When everything is in order, the driver is issued an official badge. The wish of good luck is always appreciated. The pageantry of the Grand Prix actually begins with safety inspection. Every car that races at Watkins Glen must pass a series of safety checks before it is allowed on the track. The resulting array of racing equipment provides an orgy of sightseeing for sports car fans. They watch and watch the colorful cars and sometimes the even more colorful drivers. The inspectors look too, but for a diff a race would be no safer than the cars that enter it. Every car must be mechanically perfect. Nothing is left to chance. We're made to go on and come off easily. And the rain provides the means for an impromptu washdown. Nothing interrupts the rare treat of this concentration of racing equipment. A unique fuel system gets informal inspection. A well-known driver must be pointed out. Throughout the inspection, Kendall engineers are busy assisting officials with technical problems, recommending the proper lubricant for the critical needs of the car. Your mother was just a girl when this old timer first burned up the roadways. It's still going strong, and there's a parade to prove it. The Concours d'Elegance, the Glen's famous review of antique cars, is competition driving of another sort. Dozens of these masterpieces compete for prizes on authenticity and appearance. Fords, the strutting Stutz, a vintage Allard, an elegant MG sedan, recapturing a moment of glory before the old once again gives way to the new. The wonderful world of competition driving exists only because of the men and women who help create it. The night before race day is a time for these people to talk about the sport they love. Past performances are relived. Now you've got something that you can sterilize the bottle. All friendships are renewed. Those who have seen enough races to know claim there is a spirit in Watkins Glen at Grand Prix time that cannot be matched anywhere. It is a spirit of Mardi Gras and excitement. It fills the streets as thousands of holiday bent sport fans shrug off the worries of business, mortgage payments, and babysitters. 
Behind the scenes, race officials work into the night. It's not unusual to find Florence Smalley and her staff double-checking the inspection reports of last-minute entries, oblivious of the gaiety outside. Race day. A late-night storm that has left the course muddy and misty cannot dampen the enthusiasm. Nearly 30,000 fans will pass through the ticket gates. Others have arrived days ahead of the actual races to claim premium viewing sites along the two and three-tenths miles of track. Much of the early morning activity centers about the service area. Throughout the day, drivers and mechanics will express their preference for Kendall products by making and technical service facilities which the refinery provides. And still they keep coming. Cars, drivers, spectators. Some competition cars are tuned too critically for normal driving and must be towed to the race course. Violet Corvette from Chicago. Cunningham's capable Lister Jaguars. A Ferrara Testa Rosa from Georgia. An arrogant Lotus from Pennsylvania. No matter how carefully a driver prepares his car, there are always jobs to be done in the paddock as race time nears. The rigors of practice day driving, which is mandatory for all entrants, and conducted under regular race conditions, make many of these adjustments necessary. Bugs that were not present during safety inspection are often aggravated into full-blown mechanical disorders during practice driving, giving the driver an opportunity to correct them before the actual race begins. of these last-minute problems are infinite. Some are complicated. Others require only an oil change for solution. Now it is nearly time for the first race. Starting grids which prescribe arrangement of cars for this event are consulted. The cars move out. When a race official says, toe the mark, he means it. A United States Senator is on hand to watch the lineup. Briefing is conducted by the Chief Steward. For medical reasons, in case of a crash, each driver has been instructed not to drink water before the race, not to chew gum during the race, not to wear dentures until after the race. But competition driving is tight, thirsty work, and you need teeth to chew the gum that eases the tension. The starter's flag drops. The first race of the Watkins Glen Grand Prix is underway. The Maseratis and Allards, a Ferrari and Healy, take a calculated lead. The little Formula 3 Coopers and an Effie scurry to bring up the rear. These cars were positioned last on the starting grid. They have no self-starters. They must be pushed by hand to turn over their engines. Their little 500 cubic centimeter engines make great bursts of speed impossible but their low center of gravity and phenomenal cornering abilities allow unusual maneuvering. If you push a Cooper before the race, you slide it during the race. Like most Grand Prix events, this race is open to more than one class of car. Thus, it is possible for a driver to win in his own class without necessarily leading the entire field. 
Flag signals from the race communications men keep drivers informed on track conditions. Each color has a meaning. Green means all clear. But trouble can shape up fast on the race course. Word of the crash has flashed to race communication headquarters. The severity of the accident is appraised. The call is relayed to an emergency area. The exact location of the wreck is pinpointed. Within seconds, emergency vehicles are dispatched. Fast action and crack teamwork can keep a limited accident from turning into an out-and-out -out disaster. The situation is under control. Close coordination of these highly trained volunteer safety men has paid off. Green flag to the drivers is again in order. Anxious officials are informed that the accident is not serious. Details are duly recorded in the timer's log. Eight different events comprise the Watkins Glen Grand Prix. Each is devoted to two or more classes of cars, with the exception of the Collier Brothers Memorial Race. Here, only production class MGs are allowed to compete. Sam and Miles Collier, charter Watkins Glen drivers, were distinguished for the skill and sportsmanship they demonstrated at the wheels of the car they drove best, the MG. While leading the 1950 Grand Prix, Sam Collier's car left the course in a fatal accident. A few years later, Miles Collier, winner of the 1949 Grand Prix, died of polio. Road racing lost champions of the highest caliber with the passing of these men. But they'll be remembered as long as MG's race at Watkins. When they're not racing, drivers love to talk about racing. A favorite topic is the chicane, a series of tricky turns which are often built into a course to reduce the hazards of long, uninterrupted bursts of speed. Drivers call the chicane at Watkins, Harry. Drivers come into the chicane at speeds that sometimes exceed 120 miles per hour. Mastering the hairpin turns requires an adroit combination of braking, downshifting, and navigation. The resulting speed reduction of a full field of cars sometimes creates a jam up that's reminiscent of Sunday traffic on the highway. The chicane can be tricky even when a driver finds it empty. that can't make it at all, there's an escape route. The yellow flag means caution. Re-entry is allowed at the flagman's discretion. Spin-outs are liable to occur anywhere on the course. But you see them most often at tight turns when a driver overestimates the cornering ability of his car. During a spin, the driver's first concern is to keep the car upright. Next, he must clear himself off the course to avoid a pilot. A smartly engaged reverse gear can often save the day. Competition drivers admire these skills. Those who have mastered them share the knowledge. Track safety and the welfare of racing depends on it. Competition driving has been compared to golf. In both sports, the participant improves with experience and the right choice of clubs or vehicles. The Queen Catherine Cup race is an exciting proving ground both for driving skill and the specially modified equipment that has been chosen to test that skill. The race is open to classes F, G, and H cars, all modified. Represented in the field are versions of the Porsche, the Lotus, the Elva, and the Fiat, as well as an Oscar, Bandini, and Martin. Engine displacement ranges from 750 to 1,500 cubic centimeters. 
In a field of this size, private duels developed, turning the track action into several races in one. Two of the Elvas locked full bore, neither giving way for lap after lap. Magnificent driving can be seen in clashes such as these. Spectators know the problem is what to look from. Grandstands fill up early, but sports are famous for their ability to improvise. Some of the improvisions are elaborate. Others are more primitive. They race to win, but in a sense, winning is incidental to the thrill of competing. They all compete well, proving themselves and their cars. When you see them on the city streets, Corvettes look small. But on the track, next to Jaguars and Ferraris, the Corvette is a great thundering steed. By comparison to most sports cars, they are big, with engine displacements of 4.6 liters and more. Here again, the drivers find their rivals as Corvette 51, a Canadian entry, challenges the lead taken by the Violet Chevrolet. For 17 laps, the two Corvettes slug it out, practically ignoring the hurrying Jags and Ferraris. Then, the Canadian car is forced into the escape route while its rival thunders to victory. And to the victor belong the spoils. Pretty girls, a wreath of laurels, the checkered flag. Then, the victory lap. The plaudits of the crowd. And one of the few times, a competition driver has an empty course all to himself. The stage now is set for the big race, the Grand Prix. And the tremendous vitality of Watkins Glen takes a breather. Time for a quick stop before the biggest race of the day. Once the grid lineup is formed and drivers signal they are ready, the race is in the hands of the starter. He must unleash several thousand horsepower without a second of forewarning. The traditional starter at Watkins Glen is Tex Hopkins, the man in the lavender suit. Every eye follows his deceptively casual walk. Then, Bill Sandler's Corvette Special makes a heroic bid for the lead but can't top the startling acceleration of the Lister Jaguars. From the very beginning, it's clear that Walter Hanskin and Ed Crawford and the Listers are going to be the men to beat. The field thins out fast as the inherent speeds of the four classes of modified cars become apparent. These are the fast cars, the hot iron. The drivers who handle them are brave men. As they roar into the chicane, Sadler still hounds the Listers. Then into the backstretch, where there's no room for the feather-footed. Maximum speeds of over 140 miles per hour can be developed here, with every last rev coaxed from the engines. is a long race, 44 laps, 101 miles. Each driver handles such a race differently, depending on the capabilities of his car and himself. If a comfortable lead is possible initially, the driver will take it. 
Then ease his speed a little, not to overtax the car. This is the kind of race the Listers are trying to drive. The Red Saddler Special won't let them do it. Saddler is out to win. He is driving hard. He is driving persistently. refuses to let up. His fourth lap has set a new course record. Now, he is racing against himself as well as other drivers. All the driving is superb, as mile after mile of twisting, turning track falls prey to the modified Ferraris and Jaguars, the Bristol and Twin Cam MG. On the 23rd lap, Crawford beats his own record with a new lap time of one minute and 32 seconds. He has had to reach maximum speeds of close to 150 miles an hour on straightaways to compensate for the precious seconds lost at treacherous 30 mile an hour turns. His speed is terrific, unrelenting. Then it begins to tell. He spins into the grass. His pit signals a slowdown. The grind begins to take its toll in mechanical failures and depleted fuel tanks. The Saddler Special has made two pit stops and must leave the race entirely. Even the Lister Jags are not without trouble as brakes begin to lock. The checkered flag goes to Crawford. He has won the Grand Prix. Instead of the usual pretty girl, Crawford chooses the pit chief, Alfred Momo, for his victory lap partner. It's a rare moment filled with champagne, laurels, and interviews. It is the time of the competition driver, and Crawford is the symbol. Nothing remains of race day now but the presentation of awards. Tangible recognition of wish for the sport of road racing. Their performance today has been a credit to the sport. The record books have been closed. The timers and officials have left. The crowds and cars and drivers have moved on. Only the race course remains, a breeding place, perhaps of the new champions to whom Juan Fangio paid tribute in his retirement address. The race course waits patiently until the competition drivers once again bring their Jaguars and MGs and Elvas to Watkins Glen.